When working with clients, I notice that people get confused about the basic terminology when it comes to this AI space. And no surprise, because of all of the marketing endeavors, it's easy to get lost. That's why I recorded a video where I quickly show you the meaning of each of those concepts. So I not just tell you, I'll show you what prompt engineering is, what RAG is, and hopefully you'll get what it is not. I'll show you some results of a fine-tuned model, and I'll show you how pre-training might look like. With that being said, let's get right into it. We'll start with the most fundamental, most important concept, and that is of prompt engineering. When building AI apps, you'll be spending 80% of the time doing the prompt engineering, very similar to spending 80% of the time on massaging or processing the data when building ML models. Terms like zero-shot prompting, few-shot prompting, chain of thought, all of that belongs to the prompt engineering category. So here's an example. We'll start a new chat here. We have an ask, we say, hey, remove all the personally identifiable information from this email. We don't tell the model how it should be done. The model just does it the best way it knows how to do it. And we're done. That's one shot prompting. Here's an example of few shot prompting where we uh, say generate a rhyming couplet and then we kind of give examples of the outputs so that the model knows what exactly we're asking from it. And we're doing it a few times, so that's few short prompting. Right? So all of that is prompt engineering. And normally, you wouldn't be doing this in the window. You'll be using some sort of framework that would let you kind of capture the prompts you used, the outputs generated, how happy you were with results, etc., etc., etc. And that's that for prompt engineering. Now, the next concept is RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation. It's a level up compared to just simple prompt engineering in a way that to answer the user's request, the LLM needs to go and fetch the missing information from the provided documents. Usually it's some sort of text documents, be it PDF, words, etc. Now, let me quickly show you what or how RAG looks. In essence so here is a PDF uh, it's a story it's called the mysterious artifact and it is intentionally packed with very specific details it's about a girl Fiona and she finds a ring and it has initials and she, she carries it to a professor it's a great story um, and here are some very specific questions to this story now, the rag will look like this. We'll say, hey, LLM, I have this extra information, extra file for you. And then I have a very specific question regarding that file. So in this case, we'll be uh, asking for the uh, initials engraved on the compass that Fiona found. And sure enough, it, it finds the, the right answer to this. And it could also be summarizing documents, stuff like that. I think what's important to understand is that, for example, if you were to upload the CSV file and you would expect that ELM will somehow understand, oh, it's a uh, CSV, must be a table. If it's a table, then maybe I could kind of query it in a structured way. So that is not RAC. RAC doesn't understand the intrinsic structure of a document. It only understands text. Now, level up from just simple RAC could be building rag on top of some sort of a graph, but that's outside of our discussion today. So that was the example of rag. Now, fine tuning. Sometimes the model that you have available to you doesn't give you the results you really want. As in, they are okay, but they're not quite there. And you've done all sorts of kind of improvements with prompt engineering and still the results are not quite there. You can potentially improve the results of this model or rather tune them to your needs if you have some extra kind of examples for the model to learn from. Now, as of today, there are two ways of fine-tuning available. One is domain-specific fine-tuning, and for that you just need text. You just basically provide the text to the model, it goes over it, it's also called continuous pre-training. So basically the, the model continues training on your documents and it 
get slightly more adjusted to your needs. So that's one way of fine tuning. Another way of fine tuning is instructions based fine tuning. In instruction based fine tuning, you have a data set of questions you, you would like to be able to ask the model and then the answers that you expect from it. And the list goes on and ideally you have like hundreds and thousands of those. I personally never done the domain adaptation fine tuning, but I did uh, instruction based fine tuning. That works pretty well. We were able to bring the accuracy of multi-class classification of like 60 to more than 90%, which is great. Now let me show you how like this fine tuned results could be different from, from the original response. Here's the input. Uh, the instruction is to summarize the text, the input text, and that was the, the original response. Um, Ned Wolf, Alex Wolf are from New York City. They are now adults and they have a band called Naked Brothers Band. And then the, the mo this model was fine-tuned on multiple instruction-based examples. So basically there was a question and the example of the desired response. And after fine-tuning, you could see that it became a bit more factual, right? So it didn't change that much. The essence is still there, but it probably sends from, from the examples that it has been fine-tuned on that, well, okay, they're expecting more of a factual base approach from me. That's what fine-tuning is. And the last thing is pre-training. Pre-training is basically building your own LLM model from scratch. Roughly speaking, the only way why you would want to do so is if you were to have access to large amounts of very specific, domain-specific or private information that the publicly available LLM models didn't have access to at the time of training. Then And you really need to have lots and lots of that information. So then you can consider building your own model and then, of course, have the full control over it. Some people do it, but I think it's more kind of for fun, to be honest, these days. I don't think it's practical to pre-train your own LLM. To explain you how pre-training could look like, how it works, I'll show you what New York Times did with the 800,000 words of Jane Austen texts. So they trained their own model or pre-trained their own LM on Jane Austen texts. And that's how the first round of training looked like. So that was the input. You must decide for yourself, said Elizabeth. And then the model generated gibberish. Okay. And then after 250 rounds, so basically of 250 times of going over those 800,000 words, the model started generating something that resembled words, but still didn't have much meaning to it. Fast forward to 5,000 iterations, you see that there are already words, right? But they don't make much sense yet, but the words are already there. And then after 30,000 iterations, the text looks almost comprehensible. Okay, and here's a graph that shows the improvement of the model with the number of iterations. So you see that it improves really fast up to the first 5K, and that's where the first big words start appearing and then it kind of flattens out. But then again, doing your own pre-training or pre-training LLM model is very compute intense and I don't think it makes sense today. Maybe it will make sense in months, I don't know. So hopefully I help you to make sense of these different concepts. I also try to kind of show you each of them so we don't just talk about them, but kind of see what they look like. Let me know if that was helpful and have a great day.